What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the FN Studios. This is Five Rounds. Coming up in the show, we will hear from one of Canada's top lightweight fighters. We look ahead to the UFC's return to network television. We take a look back at Fight Night 35, but we start with the mind game. John Ramdean, of course, Robin Black, joined by Dr. David Klonsky, a professor from the University of British Columbia, psych professor, of course. Uh, we had a chance to have a couple of beers last night. Uh, we want to know who consumes mixed martial arts in your, from your perspective. The perception has been a bit of a problem because there's influential politicians and media figures, especially in the U.S., who see MMA fans as bloodthirsty. They compare MMA to, to porn, to the most immoral things you could think of, human cockfighting. And, and this has gotten the way of MMA's popularity. It's gotten the way of MMA being sanctioned. In my, where I live now in Vancouver, it finally it can be sanctioned at the professional level. New York still won't sanction it. And so I got curious about this and decided to collect some data. Uh, and, did a survey of about 600 adults in the United States, asked them, you know, are you a fan of MMA? Had some comparison conditions. Are you a fan of hockey? Are you a fan of basketball? Are you a fan of action movies? Things like that. And measured things like empathy, like charitable giving, like volunteerism, like the personality trait agreeableness. You know, are MMA fans bereft? On, or are they low on these good things? And the short answer is that they're not. Uh, essentially, being an MMA fan means you like MMA. And, a, you're, and you're, you like shirts with skulls and battle axes on them for some right. reason. But short of that, there's very little in the way of connection to any kind of am amoral behavior or views, right? The only thing we learned is that if you like romantic comedies, you're a little more agreeable. Um, but if you're an MMA fan, you can be just as lovely a person as anyone else. Uh, there's, there's no connection to, to these kinds of things. Yeah, what got you involved? Why did you get involved in mixed martial arts and decide to maybe base your studies on, on this sport? Well, I've been a sports fan for a while, and what I've always loved about sports is there is this high-level mental game where you have to practice technique, learn your strategy, but then you have to implement that in a real-time, fast-paced, highly physical, high-stakes environment. And for me, MMA is the ultimate version of that. Yeah, and uh, people will say, uh, you know, we, we've heard this a million times, fighting is 90% mental. What, what does that mean, and is that so? I think it's true for people competing at, at a high level. If you're good enough, that's absolutely the case. Um, I love MMA and have been involved as a corner man, you know, working with fighters here and there, but I also wanted to step in the cage. And I'm a little bit old for this, I'm undertrained, but I wanted that experience, and so I did it. And I was mentally ready, I felt mentally ready, even in hindsight I was mentally ready, but I got destroyed. Uh, and that's because the guy I was fighting was up here, and I right. was down here. So it's, it's not 90% mental if you're not good enough, but if you're good enough to compete at, at the highest levels, then absolutely it becomes 90% mental. How do you mental. know when you're mentally prepared? That's a hard question because one of the, the, the quintessential example for me about people knowing that they're mentally prepared is knowing that if you have doubt, for example, if you have fear, that that's okay. You can train with that. You can fight with that. And a lot of people think being mentally prepared means you get rid of that for all time. And uh, we've seen some really nice examples of this. Uh, Chael Sonnen talking to Uriah Faber on Ultimate Fighter. Uh, Randy Couture talks about this. Uh, GSP has talked about it. You compete with the fear, with the doubt. And this is just one small aspect of the mental game, but it's the one that I feel comes up the most and is misunderstood the most. When, uh, when I was fighting, I fought on the same card as Joe Dirksen once. And I, you have this tingling feeling in your hands where you actually feel like maybe you're not gonna be able to perform physically in the time right before it. You feel that something's physically different. And I asked Joe, and, he, and it was fight number 60 for him. And Joe was like, no, you feel that always. And you become accustomed to how normal that experience is so you don't doubt it or feel like you can't perform. Right, and if, if you're early in your career and you feel that doubt and you interpret it as meaningful, this means I'm not ready, that distracts you, that makes you less confident, can really interfere with your fighting. You fight, first of all, if you can realize that that's normal. And then of course, if you yeah. have experience with it, it's just as part of the experience. Why do you feel anxious or, or fearful? Because you're a fighter. You Why should. are you excited? Because you're a fighter. Why do you love what you do? Because you're a fighter. It's just part of it. You embrace it. You fight with it. What are some of the ways that psychology plays into mixed martial arts? So many ways. Um, I think the most obvious is the emotional uh, domain. You know, what emotions are optimum for fighting? What emotions get in the way? And if you have them, how do you deal with them? but other areas too. So basic principles of learning is something psychologists know a lot about. And learning comes into play for everything. Long-term training, how do you become an expert in something? How do you learn? What about short-term training when you're training a particular strategy or set of techniques for an upcoming fight? How do you get that learning to translate into the cage? Uh, how many people have a great game plan? They step in the cage, the first time they're hit, game plan goes out the window. And then you have people who, like Carlos Condit, who that game plan stays, and they've learned to implement that uh, mental game plan 
in the high-paced, physical, demanding environment, and they can stick with it. Uh, so many other domains, too, especially when you make it to the highest levels, public persona, how do you portray yourself to the media, um, understanding that, um, many other domains. Can, can you evolve your mental game? Like, if you go back in history and read some of the things about Vitor Belfort, it seemed that Vitor Belfort was always terrified, that sometimes his trainers had to push him to get inside of the cage. And you have to figure, this is a guy competing at the highest level, and stepped inside the cage or ring countless times. Can a fighter go from being terrified mentally to... I'm, I've dealt with a, a number of circumstances. I've dealt with things in my life. Now I'm a different person. Is that possible? You absolutely can involve your mental game. It's similar to the question, can you, involve, can you evolve your physical game? Of course. But when we ask that about the physical game, we all understand that, that there's a lot of different elements to that. You can evolve your striking, your grappling, your wrestling, your cardio, your explosiveness. Uh, a lot of times when people ask about the mental game, they ask about it as if it's just one thing, to be mentally strong or not strong. And the mental game can be broken down into just as many elements. And yeah, you can work on these elements, you can incorporate them into your training, you can work with a psychologist to do that, but you can, a lot of good trainers uh, already know this stuff, or at least they know a lot of it, and they incorporate that into their training. So you absolutely can evolve yourself mentally. John uh, brought up Vitor Belfort, and it makes me have to ask this because this has been, you know, a conversation I've had with a number of people. But when we talk about testosterone replacement therapy, it's something that's popped up a lot in fighting. There is a relationship between testosterone and confidence. So we're not just talking about somebody taking something that makes them physically perform better, but psychologically it may help, right? Absolutely. And and psychologically can hurt if someone has learned to compete with that, they've learned to be successful with that, and then suddenly they have to compete without it. Sure, there might be a reduction in, in strength, but there also might be a reduction in mental confidence that you're the same fighter. And then maybe the first time you land something and your opponent's not rocked, you start yeah. to question, are you the same fighter? Right. What are some of the tools that uh, a fighter can use? Uh, let's, say, let's just say Robin came to you and said, you know what, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm having mental issues about training, about That's getting true. back inside of the cage. Uh, what are some of the tools that you would use to help a fighter get mentally prepared? It depends so much on the individual right. fighter. Same thing if, if someone was going to be uh, you know, an expert in, in, a, in boxing or, or striking or, or grappling. Right, you, you'd have to assess the individual person. What are they good at? What are they not good at? What's their body type? Um, and, and then you could come up with a plan. And it's, and it's honestly the same thing mentally. What's going on in their life? Uh, how have they done in their most recent fights? What was the experience for them like mentally in their most recent fights? And, and so on. There's, there's some things that you just sort of, if you're really desperately trying to get better as a fighter, you just kind of stumble onto yourself. But you could go and ask a psychologist to help you with one. But one that, you know, I know a lot of fighters realize is they'll take that walk to the cage mm -hmm. five, six, seven times before and simulate the environment. And you and I talked about BJ Penn would actually go as far as bringing into the gym an audience to boo him, an announcer, somebody to put ice on him, all of the things. How can that help a guy? It's a very, very smart move to do that. Most of the time when we're conscious, our brain is processing things automatically. Most of, our, of what our brain's doing is automatic. So, you know, if you're hanging out somewhere, someone says your name, and all of a sudden you, you hear it, it's because your brain's been monitoring the cortex, that the whole time. Right? Uh, frontal cortex, limbic system are sort of two different parts of the brain, but they're, they're active in ways that we're not fully aware of. Right. And the reason why that matters is because if you walk into a novel situation, like you've trained a lot, but now there's a crowd, now there's a cage, now there's lights, and that's new to you, a tremendous part of your automatic processing, those resources will be devoted to your brain processing, oh, there's that, there's that, what's that? There's and the crowd, there's that mm, sound. Absolutely. Well, what are these lights, that UFC logos in the middle, all of that. And now you have fewer resources devoted to the task at hand. So if you could get used to that stuff in advance, you know, the crowd, you know, cheering or booing, no big deal. The lights, no big deal. You've been in the cage before. You've maybe visualized this or you've actually physically created the setup. Now when it comes fight time, there's that much less out there that's new and your brain can just be focused on the task at hand which is implementing that game plan and, and fighting. What I think is so interesting is people sort of assume these things kind of anecdotally help but they actually help change the way your brain processes, right? That's fascinating. You absolutely can make long-standing changes. The same way you can make long-standing changes to your physical capabilities, you can uh, practice these things mentally and be better. So basically, you're saying that octagon shock can be a real thing. Of course, that's a term that's been used over the last number of years where guys say, you know, I train with some of the best fighters in the world. I do these things. I work mm -hmm. my butt off, but 
st stepping inside of the cage, it's a different animal. Right. So you're saying it's absolutely real. Absolutely. Dana White talks about that, that a lot. It's absolutely real for at least two reasons, probably more. One is what we're talking about. There could be so much that's new. You just don't have the resources that you usually do in, in your sort of regional fights or your lower level promotion fights. But the other is, is simply intuitive. The stakes are higher. So your emotions are running higher. And you, know, you, you mentioned uh, you know, sort of different parts of the brain. Well, when your emotions are high, that's sort of your limbic system taking off, taking some of that energy away from the frontal cortex, which allows us to do more complex thinking to implement our game plans. So those are at least two ways in which octagon shock uh, can be very real. Obviously, you're, you're a big fan of the sport. Who are some of the guys that you look at to say, wow, these guys are mental giants? Uh, f first comes to my mind is uh, Randy Couture. Um, both for many different reasons. One is he got early on how to deal with fear, doubt, things like that, and that is that you accept them, you embrace them. You, uh, I think in his words, you make peace with them. I might get knocked out. If that happens, I'll be okay. Now I can implement my game plan because I'm not avoiding you know, this, this scary uh, possibility. But another reason why I, I highlight him is because he was an expert at both formulating a game plan and then executing right. it in the cage. And that's very difficult. Uh, someone else who comes to mind as being better at that latter attribute is Carlos Condit. He took a lot of heat for maybe not engaging uh, Nick Diaz as much as, as he could have. Um, that aside, Gotta play the smart game, yeah. though. I yeah. thought it was a brilliant game yeah. plan, and I thought it was brilliant how he executed it because so many people step in that cage and the game plan's out the window the moment they get hit. And every minute of that fight, Carlos Condit stuck to his game plan, and that is a very difficult thing to do. Few fighters can do it. GSP can do that, but it's very rare, and it's, it's, a, it's one of the important mental qualities. I have to agree with you. Randy Couture, without question, one of the most mentally strong fighters on the planet. When we come back to five rounds, we look back at Fight Night 35. Welcome back to Five Rounds. Fight Night 35 went down in Duluth, Georgia. Last week, the main event, Luke Rockhold, former Strike Force middleweight champion, taking on the hard-hitting Costa Filippou. And I think going into this fight card, Robin, a lot of people were like, wow, why should I tune in? These guys both coming off losses, no real star power. But I think that we saw that change with uh, Luke Rockhold and his first round stoppage victory over the former training partner of Chris Weidman. Luke Rockhold looked absolutely phenomenal. And he says, you know what? I now want to fight Vitor Belfort on American soil. He's uh, creating some interest and I like it. Yeah, I do too. And I think this was sort of not so much a star uh, showcase, but a star making performance. Yeah. This was one where you know now that people are going to pay attention to this tall, good looking, badass kicker. And really his kicking performance that's what we talked about. Really, we talked about it before the Vitor Belfour fight first, and we didn't get to see it, but we saw it in this one, beautifully uh, moving his opponent around the cage beautifully and setting up that liver shot. Landed one hard first to the body where the, his own elbow hurt him. Costa Filippo tried to hide that pain and then delivered the second one and put him out. What is interesting, you talk about the kicking game of Luke Rockhold. That's what he's known for right now. You go and look at some of his highlight reels. It's all of his kicking game. You talked yeah. about his kicking game. Now is the time for him to change things up because people are anticipating this. Isn't it now time to pull things out of your back pocket and showcase uh, a new wrinkle to your game? Well, interesting, uh, 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 Vitor Belfort's last three wins are all related to a head kick. So if he does face Vitor, they're, both guys go in there and you'll expect a kicking performance. And you're absolutely right. I would expect something very, very different. When somebody starts preparing for one thing, if you've got more, and Luke Rockhold has more, great wrestling, great jujitsu, and nice hands that he underuses because his kicks are so good. Good from distance. So when you face him next time, he's going to be a different animal. It really was a solid show. Brad Tavares, Lorenz Larkin, for my money, Ramsey Najim, and Justin Edwards. Uh, but what did you take away from the card? Because you said you saw it and there were a lot of things that made you happy. Yeah, you know, we've been talking a fair bit about those areas in between non positions and semi positions where you're not quite boxing, you're not quite wrestling. And we saw that at a really high level on this show where things that on first glance look like a mauling or control are very strategic and very technical. Let's take a look at some of them. 
First up, we had Elias Silverio. This guy was incredibly dominant. And when you look back at what he did, on some level, it just looks like he took him down and controlled him. But you can see how strategic he is here, trying to take care of that right arm with his knee. If he could just put that, that knee on the arm, it'll prevent him from posting. But here, as he starts to post, you've got to address his right arm. So what do you do? Heavy on the hip. And if you start punching him, he's got to protect himself. Or you attack that right arm. That's the post to be able to get to your feet. So you can see how strategic it is. You uses the punches as he takes to his feet, step in deeper, and now press the hip down. This is so planned. This is something he works on in the gym. This isn't just what happens. These guys went to the ground. He knows exactly what he's doing as he's still trying to attack the right arm and flip back and forth between attacking the right arm and punching him. And you see here, this is another great position. He's in the half guard, and as his opponent's turning into him, he will reach underneath here and threaten a Darce choke. Now, you have to address that Darce choke as he presses on the back of your head. You come up. He punches you, moves to a front face lock. Really interesting non-position stuff. And TJ Dillashaw, people have talked a lot about the striking he had in this fight. And it was sensational, but I loved his grappling as well. We see here he takes Easton to the ground. You cannot stand up without your feet on the ground. So what does he do? Elevates the feet. It's such great control. And here we see he's putting that hook in and he's going to take the back. But he's going to lose this. This is kind of a non-position half guard top here. He'll threaten the head and arm choke here. Like you can see, Easton has to address that. And as he moves to the other side there, you see again, same strategy, trying to get his knee in or threaten it in on the right arm of Easton. As he addresses that, you get a free elbow for your trouble. You see him doing it here again. So he's trying to keep his opponent's mind active. You gotta worry about your arm, then he's punching you in the face. You gotta worry about your striking, and here he's gonna take you to the ground. And the feeling he would have at this point is that he's in charge on the ground. He's gonna, uh, Easton looks to get to his feet, he delivers a knee, goes to his back. So Easton is always the one trying, and here again with that post arm, slipping in and trying to take away the post. So you saw between these guys, and we've seen a lot of it lately, where guys are really starting to understand these areas in between positions and how to keep another guy active and defending while you attack. Just some great, great stuff. Uh, Robin, earlier in the show we were talking about mental strength and there are very few fighters in the world that are as mentally strong as Chris Weidman. And we had a chance to talk to him about the same type of thing, about the in-between game, whereas it's not really defined yet. There's no real names for yeah. things in between. And where do you, where do you anticipate? in the future, are there gonna be names given to some of these scrambles or in between positions? In certain top gyms where guys are really concentrating on this now, it isn't enough to just, you know, you're in side control, you know what to do here. You're on a back, you know what to do. It's these areas where a guy escapes one thing. We used to call them scrambles. We used to call them non-positions. In certain gyms, guys will say, let's go to that post sequence where yeah. we attack the post. And they're now defining these non-areas and giving them names, making, uh, you know, in the gym training specific strategies of what to do in places we used to call a scramble. Uh, you and I had the good fortune to be with Joel Gerson who was teaching us some of Ronda Rousey's techniques from a judo standpoint and he says a lot of things that she does are in between so it's in between one technique and in between a second technique and now you've kind of created a hybrid so to speak a hybrid position or a new position and it comes down to feel a lot of times. Yeah that's the thing it's like we we do put names on certain things this is a mount this is a half guard and so forth but every single way that you can combine two men's bodies or two women's bodies in a fight, that is a strategic position. And the top guys are defining exactly what it is and what you need. Does this underhook work? If you don't have it, you need an underhook equivalent. And you're starting to have a strategy in literally every positional combination of human bodies. TJ Dillashaw looking absolutely phenomenal, and you can't blame him. Number one, led by Uriah Faber. And Uriah Faber, we talked about what a killer year he had in 2013. And it all comes down to lead by example. And if this is your guy, if this is the coach, the owner of the school that's absolutely killing everybody, working harder than everybody in the gym. You just expect that he, he would want that from his students, and we've seen it from, obviously, Dillashaw and Chad Mendez and yeah. Joseph Benavidez. So I think Uriah Faber is really doing such a good job, and that's why Team Alpha Male still talked about as the, one of the best gyms in the world. Yeah, you say lead by example. You got a guy in Uriah Faber taking a fight with one of the pound for pound greats coming up very soon, facing this guy on four weeks notice and saying, damn right, I'll get in and fight him. When you lead by example like that, you get a gym of incredibly confident driven athletes. When we come back to the show, we look ahead to Fox 10, which goes down in Chicago.
Welcome back to Five Rounds. Coming up on Saturday night, the UFC invades the United Center in Chicago for UFC on Fox 10. We hear from a Canadian lightweight who weighs in on the main event. Oh, it's a, it's a close fight. It's a really good fight. Both are really good fighters. Um, maybe slight edge to Benson, just a little more, uh, a little more, maybe a little more athletic, a little more, a little more horsepower. But Joss is really technical and fast, so I see it being a really competitive fight. Maybe slight edge to Benson, but I could see either guy winning, and I wouldn't be surprised. A great main event, Josh Thompson, former Strikeforce lightweight champion, taking on the former UFC lightweight champion and former WEC champion in Ben Henderson. I absolutely love this fight. I have a feeling we might see the number one contender in the lightweight division as long as Josh Thompson wins this fight. You've got a feel for Ben Henderson as he's lost twice to Anthony Pettis. But uh, we heard what Bochak had to say, uh, Benson Henderson simply having more horsepower, or is he a little bit biased because he beat, he faced him and he lost to him? Well, there's something you learn by hooking up with a guy, right. physically engaging him, and Bochak definitely learned that. I agree with him, I think, that Ben Henderson has more horsepower. Ben Henderson thinks he's a better kickboxer, a better wrestler, and better at jiu-jitsu than his opponent, but I got to disagree, man. I think Thompson edges him in each of those areas. Thompson's a dynamic striker, an explosive kickboxer, Really, really seasoned everywhere. He's gone five rounds. I think this is his time, but his name isn't Anthony Pettis, so it's going to be tough to beat Henderson. I don't know, man. I love this fight. Henderson has the ability to kind of control the big picture of the fight, but I think Thompson's a little better at the small details. It's going to be exciting. Thompson, of course, very explosive, very athletic, been in this game a long time, but you mentioned five rounds. Ben Henderson, I think his last five fights have all been championship fights. This guy knows how to perform under pressure. Uh, what do you anticipate the game plan is? As simple as use his kicking game, which we've seen before, or does he try to put the fight down to the ground? Man, I, I think you've got to be ready. Literally one of those, you know, general terms of ready for everything because both of these guys have everything. It really is going to see how Thompson is in rounds four and five if we get there. If you're Thompson, I think he's going to come out pretty explosive like he did against Diaz and really try to make a statement because no better way to get in there than a nice big knockout of Henderson. But, you know, how are you going to do that? That is not easy. It's a really Really, really great fight. I'll give the edge to Thompson, and he's so exciting to watch. But Henderson could easily find a way to make this a five-round control For fight. For Thompson, the last time he stepped inside of the cage was last April when he took out Nathan Diaz in impressive form. Uh, the time off. Uh, good or bad for Josh Thompson? I think it's irrelevant. The guy's been fighting for so long. He's so good under pressure. He's such a game day performer, and he's really, really fun to watch. On that note, we want to thank Dave, Dr. David Klonsky for being here. We want to thank Mark Bocek. And on behalf of Mr. Robin Black and our entire Fight Network crew, I'm John Ramdean saying so long. We'll see you next time on Five Rounds.